Thanks for being here and for sticking around. The film came about because of the wish to get it done by the woman to my right, Sandra Warren. And what inspired you, Sandy, to make this film? I, in my young teens, uh, growing up in the Northeast, I was one of those folkies that Maria Muldaur talked about, whose mind was totally blown when I first heard the Butterfield Blues Band on the Electra sampler that was a picture of which was shown in the film, and um, became a huge fan, and then um, that sort of turned me on to rock and roll, and became a huge rock and roll fan. So when I met some people uh, back east who were talking about how this a film about Butterfield had never been made and it was long overdue to make it, a uh, number of people, including Gay Butterfield, this uh, started to happen. And that was about three and a half, uh, four years ago. And here we are. And the way I got pulled into it was um, Gabe was looking for an opinion of who might direct it and happened to ask Corky, and Corky recommended me, so I can't thank him enough for that. And he was also, you know, without him, there also wouldn't have been the film uh, Sam Lay in Bluesland that we made a couple of years ago. Sam was the link to that happening. As far as my getting into music filmmaking, uh, it was a Hard Day's Night, 1964. Going to see it at the uh, Tamil, some feedback's happening, but going to see it at the Tamil Pius Theater in California. And, you know, I was a kid and my friend's mother drove us there and the crowd lost control. We got up on the stage and we touched the screen, tried to touch our favorite beetle and follow him across the screen. And, you know, and then they made us all go back to our seats and they said they were going to stop the film. But, you know, they couldn't stop the film because there was a line around the block for the next screening. And the place just kept going uh, berserk. And that was, uh, you know, that was when I knew that mixing music and movies could work. Um, Corky, I wanted to ask you, you saw the band at Big John's in its first incarnation as a four-piece. What was that like? How many here saw the Paul Butterfield band before Mike Bloomfield? Wasn't old enough. Well, that's not my problem. <laughs> before, before Mike Bloomfield. I did. The four pieces. I did. You did? I saw the four-piece band when they first came to New York. That incarnation only lasted for a while, and then Mike came in. It was astounding. One of the best things I ever saw. They came to town, they, it, was, it was Paul and Elvin, Jerome and Sam, and they played at the Village Gate. And Elvin came over to the apartment that I lived in with my girlfriend at the time, we had supper there, and we went to the gig. And I had previously seen them in Chicago, Paul and Elvin, with the rhythm section, a number of times, quite a few times, at the, uh, at the twist parties where I would play along with them, un uninvited but never discouraged, on an unamplified piano at the sidelines. But that was my image of, that's all I had to go on at the time. And when I saw them, when I saw Paul and Elvin with this fantastic rhythm section of Jerome and Sam and the way that they worked together and the sound that they made and the purity of the presentation of Paul's music, which was, which was never, it was never the same after any other musicians came in the band as it was in that four piece configuration because there was no axis of several lead players. Or it, was, it was really all about Paul. Sam sang some songs, it was great, of course. Elvin played some leads, really not a lot, never for very long, he was mostly just over his guitar like this, working hard, and, and his sound was always the heart of the band to my ear, Alvin Bishop's rhythm guitar. And, uh, and, I, and I saw the way Paul worked and, and built the music, singing a few choruses and then playing a few choruses and back and forth like that. And that was his method. And there's nothing unusual about that, but when he, after he would sing and he would return to his harmonica, it always went up a gear, just at that point, just when he came back to the harp. And so it just level by level, it went. And it's, it was a, a marvelous thing to witness. It was inspiring, it was impressive. 
the adjectives are not sufficient. And that was the four-piece band. And the next time they came to town, Mike was with them. And that was also very good. And then after a while, it became a six-piece band, and I was there too. And that was good too, especially for me. <laughs> well, I've been trying for over 50 years to try and describe what it was like to hear that four-piece band, which I've heard many, many times. And, you know, it, <clears throat> it, as a producer, you realize every time you're going to make a choice to add something, you're also at the same time making a choice to lose something. You can't add something without losing something to some degree, so, you know. But here was these four... Um, It was four people working together for a finite point. And the rhythm that came out of that oh boy. was like unbelievable. And Sam, everyone thought Sam was playing loud. They thought the reason he was so powerful is because he was playing loud. And that's not at all what was happening. He was playing music. He was playing, every note had a different quality to it. Every rhythm was varying in different ways. The dynamics were constant. And you get the feeling like you were just being run over by a train. But it was a musical train. It's a it was a wonderful feeling, isn't it? Yeah. When you lie down on the tracks, what, and then... And, and Charlie Musselwhite used to say, Sam doesn't play the drums, he sings the drums. Oh, that's nice. You know, so we had that, and we had uh, Paul, who, the way I describe Paul is he just was, with or without a harmonica, just standing there was a force of energy. I felt the same way about Mike Bloomfield. I used to think Mike Bloomfield walked around with sparks coming out of his head. <laughs> you know, and just, he didn't have to play. You see the photographs of him with the guitar. It's all you need. You don't even have to hear anything. You know, the energy. But the whole band, the, it had that, had that, like I say, it felt like just a train was coming right at you, and boy, did it feel good to be run over by that thing. How was that? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was, it was 100 miles an hour, and that was kind of your job, Sam. I know that... Paul tended to push the tempo, didn't he? He wanted to push everything to its limit. Talking to the mic and talk about that a little bit. All the time. Every song is a little tempo. Talking to the mic. I am. <laughs> I'm a big boy now. All my voice is in my gut. But both of you is, is right about what you said. About, Thank you. Man, I, I wasn't used to playing now like that. I come from a... a a little three-piece band, harmonica, guitar, and drums. That's all we had in Cleveland. The group called the Thunderbirds, we was the original Thunderbirds. And uh, then, because I, I did, admittedly, I came from a jazz band. But my love for music, I, I have to say it, I don't deny it, I'm a country boy. I love country music, then and now. But I play the blues. Well, I'm like Jimmy Dickens. I'm a plain old country boy. And then enter Michael Bloomfield. Oh, he was loud, wasn't he? Oh my God, supersonic. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wasn't used to loud playing music. And I, I still almost refuse to play it when there's a song that calls for that loud plan. I still got the tendency to break back some. Finally got used to it. The Bloomfield made me get used to it. They were loud to the extreme, I thought. I got to the place, eventually, I couldn't play soft no more. So I got accustomed to it. And 
I don't know, I tell you, like Paul Harvey, you know the rest of the story. <laughs> and you left the band when you got sick. And did it improve your standing in the musical community? Did it help you get gigs to be a veteran of Paul's band? Did that increase your value to other people? No, I, I didn't go back because I, I stayed in the hospital from, uh, from, from Christmas Eve day to after the 4th of July. I was in the hospital. This is December of 65 to yeah, 66. that's correct. And I don't, know, I, I don't know what else to tell you, but I'm here. I, I try to answer the best that I can when I get in front of the audience and try to talk to them. I don't know what to say, but the people around me all the time tell me I talk too damn much. And, <laughs> I figured, I figured you would agree with it. <laughs> I won't tell you what I'll be talking about. <laughs> I, I can't think of nothing else to tell you, but I mean, I try. I'm not, I'm not good at this. I've I, I sung my way through the world, and I still intend to do it, so. Between drums and and, and sang in the blues, I'm called between them. Well, uh, I want to talk just a little about the relationship between Bloomfield and Butterfield. They had kind of a, was it a rivalry, or how would you describe it? They, they would uh, get into some concern, all the time concerning the music. If it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't like uh, Butterfield playing, uh, somebody in the band playing something, that he didn't agree with it. He'd get a little steam on this on this collar. There was no never no fighting and all that, but it was always something about the music. Butterfield wanted to play it like he played it, and Bloomfield seemed like a lot of times he wanted to outplay him. That, that was my opinion, and he did, <laughs> you know. But there was a little confusion about that. But that's about all that I can think of. And people ask lots of times, Mark, about what Paul was like in the studio. You know, was he the kind of guy who told you what parts to play, or how did, how did that work in the recording studio? The first session that I did with the Butterfield Band, I was sitting in at the beginning of the session. And uh, he didn't tell me to do anything except uh, sit down at the organ, and I, which I, was an instrument that I really wasn't very familiar with. I was a piano player. And uh, I played a song, and when it was over, he said, well, keep playing. And I wasn't in the band yet. And uh, later on in the session, it was a long session, nine hours, triple session, he inducted me into the band. And that was uh, an experience. <laughs> But there was no instruction given to me, and, and the, the band was playing straight Chicago blues, and I did my best to fit in with it. I think I did better later on when I got used to the organ as an instrument. Now, the next time we recorded was the East West album, and by that time, the songs were already set. And so there wasn't really any need for a lot of instruction in the studio. We, we knew what we were going to play and how we were going to play it, and, and we recorded it. And so I'm not sure what you're looking for in that question, but uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, for the Butterfield Band, and this, this is true, I was on the first four albums, and that was generally the way it was. We went to the studio to play the stuff that we had worked up, we weren't inventing it in the studio. And was he the kind of guy who would heap a lot of praise on you if he liked what you were doing, or just kind of leave you, leave you be? Well, Paul was a guarded person. Uh, I don't see him as having been negative or critical, but I don't think that uh, praise was his main medium. Uh, he uh, 
He played a song that I wrote called Strawberry Jam, which was a slow instrumental, and he played it very, very beautifully. And he wanted to play it. He did not give me his opinion of it at any time that I recall. He didn't say, that was a, that's a nice piece, I want to play it. Nary a word did he speak about the song at any time. But he played the heck out of it, and, he, and we were closing shows with it. And uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I want to tell you, he, I think that some of his most emotional playing, really to me, his most, most emotional playing that he ever recorded is on that song. And I did not feel left out or neglected or let down or dejected or dissed because he did not have enconiums for me. He played the song. And would you mind if I mentioned the recording that we made of it? No. Because this, we, we did not record it in the studio. I left the band before the, uh, before the album was, before the uh, song was ever recorded in the studio. We never, and when I left the band, I'm sure they stopped playing it. Just like when Mike left the band, the band stopped playing East to West. But I did ha record a couple of renditions of it on a small portable tape recorder. And then I put it out on the label that I formed that I've been operating with my wife, Ellen, for over 25 years now, and it's the title tune of two albums that we released. It's, they've been out for so long, people here may know, know about them, but if not, I would like you to know about them. And they're made from documentary recordings of the Butterfield Band. And the first one was called Strawberry Jam. I made it the title tune. It's a, it's a miscellany of about 10 songs. These are documentary nightclub performances and they're somewhat rough. It's like a bootleg in a sense, except it's legitimate. I have a letter of agreement with Electro Records. I pay royalties to the publishers and to my former bandmates. The second one was uh, three live versions of East West. It shows the genesis of the song. And so I want you to know I'll be in the lobby when this is over at the table. If you're interested, I would like you to know about them. I have some copies with me. Also, the Percy Mayfield live album that I produced from live radio broadcasts with Percy Mayfield, where I play piano throughout, except one song, he plays piano, and I play organ. I'm very proud of these works, and so if you would, I'm gonna go right up there after this, and I, I would like to meet anybody who would like to know about those. Pardon me for pitching, but I, I brought a box of CDs here because I wanted to try to sell them, and I did sell a bunch of them upstairs after I played earlier today. I'm very happy about that, and I want to keep the joy going. Thank you. Let's open it up to some questions from the crowd. Here, here you go. Hi. Um, one thing that the, the, the great job in the movie, thank you. Uh, one thing the movie kind of brushed over quickly that I would love to hear a little more on, especially from Sam and Mark, um, it went quickly from Bloomfield passing on touring with Dylan because he so much enjoyed being with Butterfield to in the next scene he left the band and Butterfield was very upset about it. So I'd love to hear more about Bloomfield's departure from the band, why he left, what that was like for everybody else, how that transpired. Well, that's going to have to go to me. Sam wasn't in the band then, at the time that Mike left. And uh, the day that he told me that he was going to leave the band was the day that we did three college dates in the Boston area. The inference that I made from this was that, uh, I mean, I knew that there had to be other reasons. But I thought that he was perhaps thinking that this was somehow too much. Well, it wasn't too much to be driven from stage to stage, other people setting up all the equipment, and then to go out and play a, a fun set with a fun bunch of fellas. It was really a good opportunity, actually. <laughs> 
But he was known for abandoning projects when they started to become more successful. That's part of his legend. And the band was starting to do one-nighters after several years of club dates and uh, college concerts, which, which are also one-nighters, I guess. But, but it was, it was, you could see the direction it was going in. And I, I thought it was going to be really taking off and becoming very much more widely known and, and successful and popular. I don't think that that was the only reason that he wanted to leave. I think he at that point he wanted to play with some other people, and uh, he he wanted to try something else. Is is there a more specific question? I'm sorry, I I'm not sure what you're looking for. Yeah, I, whatever happened, it's just the movie talked about, which I, I didn't know that he had the opportunity to tour with Dylan Yeah, he wanted to stay with Butterfield. That's that. That's. Does that amaze you in some way? It amazes me the transition so quick. In the movie. That that he went from. Yeah, you know, being so committed to this band to being out of the band so quickly. It was like a year. Oh, oh yeah. There was there was quite a bit of time between that. I mean, there's a Dylan thing, but that was sort of late 1965. It was shortly. Well, it was it was right around the time of the first Butterfield album. And he, he wanted to play with Paul, and we had a good thing going, and he liked it, and we did a lot of things. And we made another album. And that was in 66, and it wasn't until the beginning of 67, after New Year's, that he made his departure. So I think, I, I don't think he gave it less than a full shot. I'm very disappointed that he left the band. I was then, I am now. To me, that was a magical combination. There was a real chemistry. And how much, can you imagine how much it means to me to think that I would be part of, of something like that, where I might even be part of a chemistry? That was a great chemistry when it was a five piece band. It was a fantastic chemistry when it was a four piece band. But the chemistry that it had as, as a six piece band ended. It was still a good band, though, and we made some good records. But what we were doing with that particular ensemble, I wanted to continue to do that. So if you want to know how the people felt about it, I was very disappointed. Can I, can I butt in a minute? Something you didn't realize, but I knew about it from, from the get-go. I was the one doing all the complaining about the piano player we had. i give you an example. When you played a song with the tempo, maybe like this, your piano player was he's running away with it. And I, re I even remember his name, too. I so, so said that he had kind of a mental problem. I didn't know it, but I was forever complaining about it because I had to play right. I don't care what you did. I wanted to play it like I know it goes, and he couldn't do it. Which band was this? It was, it was the same band, but... I don't, I don't, I think I, when I met you, we were in the village. That's where I met you, I think. Where you met me? We were in the village. We was at the village gate. Yeah. And uh, you came, uh, came and sit in, and I told Paul, I said, no, that's no, the fellow you need to get right no, there. No, you, I, no, you I came and no, fit right in. What we were doing, you fit right in there, perfect, man. At the Cafe I go, go it was. I think so. Where I sat in. I think oh, we I know you come in, you fit right in with the band, everything. Thank you. You were dead on the meter. And, and I, I talked Paul in the, hey, man, you get this cat. I didn't know your name at the time. But every time we played. It, well, this is new information to me. I'm very I flattered. Know Thank it you. Is. <laughs> This is a Thank reunion you. of sorts. I'm, gl I'm glad I didn't rush the tempo. That's, that's a I, relief well, to me. I ain't, I ain't crazy. I might not have no damn sense, but I ain't crazy either. <laughs> but, and I told, I told Paul, man, this is the catch you ought to talk. And I don't know if you knew about it, because I didn't talk to you about it. I don't know if Paul did. 
But I was the reason why, because I kept them, I couldn't drum with him. If the beat went, he was going, and I, I'm watching him and I'm following him. And the band going in another direction. That's what that was all about. I don't know who you do that with. You want to know his name? Sure. His name was Brian. I know his last name, too. All I know he was Brian. He was Mike Bloomfield's piano player. Yeah. No, I know the Before person. the. Mm -hmm. I know the person you're talking about. Oh. No, no, he was a, he was a problem. He, he was a trouble. problem because I couldn't He was a troubled it, person. And I threatened to quit. I said, no, we can't do that. We can't let you go. We don't let him go. I said, well, tell him I said bye. <laughs> we have a question over here. It's a musician question. So harmonica is in a different key. Well, there's a key. There is a harmon. There's a harmonica for each key. I understand. And so, as a piano player, and as Har Butterfield was harmonica player, you see Billy Branch and and Sugar with an entire belt of harmonicas. So, did Butterfield only play in a couple keys and only have a couple harmonicas? Or did the keyboard players transpose? Or how did that work back in the day? Paul Butterfield had a whole pocket full of harmonicas. Yes, he did. <laughs> he kept them in his, he wore a sports coat. And if you, sometimes you would see him and he would look like a peddler with these <laughs> bulging pockets of harmonicas. That's the way it is with diatonic harmonicas. You got to change them up. But, there, but you can use one harmonica first several different keys. It's called different positions and that has a different flavor. And the blues harp players know all about that. Is it true he played upside down? It is true that he played upside down. Uh, he actually, misnomer, he actually had back, the harmonica back, upside down. Back. He played right side up. <laughs> but, um, um. but no, this is something you don't know, Corkin. He started out actually with the first, when his first days of playing harmonica, he literally would hang upside down from a jungle gym. And, and in that position, he couldn't get the thing right until he turned the harp around. And then, and then when he got upright again, then he just kept the harp like that, relative to his own, to his own self. Yeah, that's the truth. You know, another thing, I don't know about Paul, but me, yeah. you notice I play with my eyes closed? Yeah. That's because when I knew I wanted to learn the harmonica, I studied Braille with my upper lip so I could know where the numbers are. Se so I don't have to look at the numbers when I'm playing. You're a man with sensitive lips. <laughs> sensitive lips. Do we, do we have another? <laughs> No, but this cat, when, when he came to us, we was at a rehearsal or something, and I heard him play the first time, and I told Paul, that's who you need. Because everything he played was what we were playing, and he did a good job of it. And so I talked him into it. So I, I, I would have been gone a long time ago from that band if he had, because I, I couldn't keep up with all timing. And Sam, I heard something. Is it true that you broke up that fight between Alan Lomax and oh, Grossman? Oh, they had to go again. <laughs> they, they, they were fighting about. Uh, I heard him heard him make a uh, make a, uh, a remark about, "Hey, there's your." Uh, one asked the other one, "How do you like your white blues band?" That's what that was all about, and I know. Yeah, I broke that fight up. I was always the peacemaker in the band. You broke, you broke apart Butter and Bloomfield uh, sometimes, too, didn't you? <laughs> no, I stopped them from arguing so much. People looking at um, they arguing about the music. That's, that's all I don't remember them ever arguing about it. Paul wanted it his way. And it was, I said in the thing about, hey man, you did that too fast. Then there was, they had to settle that. There was a fight between them, not a fist fight. I call arguing fighting too, but I never seen a fist fight. But I got between them to stop them from fist fighting. I've got between a lot of musicians uh, from passing blows. Albert King and, and Howlin' Wolf was two of them. It was like trying to get between two rhinoceros and push. Who, who, who do you, Sam, who, who would have won? 
Between Wolf and, and Albert King, who would have won? Between who? Say that again. Howland Wolf fighting with Albert King, who would have been the winner? N neither one of them, because I broke them up. <laughs> they, 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 I, I have to give all the musicians credit. I've been, uh, they either, one of them been in and out of one of the bands that I put together and I had to be the peacemaker and, and the band leader. <clears throat> but uh, Wolf was always into it with, 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 with somebody and I could sell them down to cool them down. No, no, I ain't saying no mixed pass. They had a, a squabble about the money. Uh, you know what, I better plead the fifth on that. I kind of, I think, I think I want to keep quiet on that one. I don't know. Oh, Sam Lay said, oh, Sam Lay said nothing. So you call Maybe. no name, you bear no blame. Question But here. I got something to tell you that would crack you up if you heard it. You wouldn't believe it. No, 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 no. I only look dumb. I ain't really dumb. I'm just playing that role. Yeah, I'm puzzled. When you say he, Paul played um, uh, upside down. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean he? Re <laughs> it means that when he went, he right. reversed it left to right, or he literally. Yeah. So he it. worked low he to, to right. the right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I thought you meant literally upside. Down. The numbers okay. go on the top. He put them on the bottom. Hey. Numbers across yeah, one. Yeah, no, I play harmonica. Okay. Oh, you play harmonica. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he just turned it over. He, that's how he started playing it, so that's how he ended up playing it. No one told him the numbers were supposed to be on the top. Time for about two more. Or they didn't. He wanted to be different. <laughs> Thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, being here and for a beautiful film, John. Um, I'm curious about two um, uh, elements of the film. Where and how you found out about that footage of the twist parties here at the university. And, and I, I also understand that a lot of the really choice color film footage that we see of Silvio's and a lot of those scenes with Paul sitting in a bar with other people and Paul in action at like Big John's. Is that from Sam Lay? Sam, is yeah. that from your personal collection? Yes, it is. The Sam Lay collection. I see a whole lot of to them, too. Did you ever have any audio uh, portion to that that got lost? Or was it They're not lost. I know where they are, but Ooh, I'm no holding, audio, no asylum. <laughs> I'm holding them for safekeeping. All right. And how about the twist party footage? Twist party footage came via Gordon Quinn of Cartem Quinn, who I know and have seen all of his films. And um, he made a film back then with his college buddies. He was a UFC student at the time. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the film, but. That's where they got it. They happened to go to the, uh, some twist parties, and they had it. And he's such a gracious, general guy, uh, generous guy. He said, "Yeah, use it." That's right. Yeah. Hmm. And okay. Sam, you know, Sam got the camera as a Christmas present for his wife. Who did she ever learn how to use it? No, I use it all the time. <laughs> I got I got film too that I hadn't seen, believe it or not. And I'll tell you why. You wonder why I hadn't seen it? Because I used to go to places like these uh well on Maxwell Street, I won't call it what everybody else call it. Corky will jump on me if I say it. But I got, I, got, I got film that I ain't never seen, and I'll tell you why. Because when I was shooting film with the camera that I bought from my wife, it was something that I had just got started. And I got that idea from Junior Parker and Bobby Blue playing carrying somebody in the band that had a movie projector, I mean a, a movie camera. And when I had them, uh, uh, take them to have them, had them to have them process, I didn't have the camera. I mean, I didn't have the projector. I shot them with an eight millimeter, and they, but they had came out with some film that I didn't know about. They all looked the same to me. They were super eight. I didn't have a super eight projector, and I still never got one, so I, 
I hadn't seen her. I got some important stuff on there too. Yeah, older than what you seen. <laughs> well, but I, I had I want to see them myself before I show them to anybody. Because I used like I say I used a, a super eight, but I didn't know it was a difference between an eight and a super. Mm -hmm. So I still got them, Pam. I don't know how many of them. We have time for one more question. This has been a really exciting uh, weekend, and this panel is just like uh, the, the icing on the cake. It's great to see uh, two members of maybe the most exciting band ever uh, to get together and reminisce. This is a great film. Uh, the Butterfield Band certainly deserves a film of, of this nature. It was very... Uh, I learned stuff. I'm a Butterfield nut, and I learned stuff. And I, I just have to give it up to the production uh, team for putting this movie out. <laughs> and and I got to uh, I got to compliment Sam on his suit. Sam Sam always has the best looking clothes around. Um, I just had one question for Mark um, from the. Uh, that get out of my life woman, that Lee Dorsey tune, did you bring that into the band? So Paul said, here, here's a tune for us to do. The first person that mentioned it to me was Mike. Okay. He said, this is going to be your first solo. Anyway, it's so great to have Butterfield alumni back in Hyde Park, uh, where this all started. and. Uh, Let's give it up for Hyde Park for kind of kick-starting the blues boom. Sorry that we ran out of time. Hopefully a few of them can stick around. I know Mark's going to be selling his CDs up in the lobby. And unfortunately, we do need to close down the first ever Logan Center Blues Fest. We thank so many of you for coming. Uh, we appreciate all your support, and we look forward to seeing you over the next couple of years back at the Logan Center. Thank you. Every now and then, find myself a sweet thing. Mm -hmm.